Hi, I'm Doug. And I'm Pat. You're not Pat. You're Tom Bukovac. Yes, I am. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Doug. And I'm Pat. This time, actually... You are Pat. I am Pat. I don't think that was a great intro. E yeah. Except that not because you weren't in it, but because well, he said that he was Pat. This is um, our road trip, Nashville, Tennessee, part one, Tom Bukovac. We've mentioned Tom Bukovac on the show a number of times, and I'm thinking maybe some people don't actually know who Tom Bukovac is or haven't tuned into his channel. He is... Um, he lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and he's a session guitar player there. And he's not just a, a regular session guitar player. He's like in the top of the food chain, he's session the, player. He's a session guitar player. He's a first call guy. In the, He's a big fish in the big pond. But in uh, COVID days, about three years ago, uh, they closed the studios down because of COVID. And so... Tom and all the other session players in the studios were kind of out of business for a while. And a friend, from what Tom says on one of his shows, suggested that he uh, go into his garage and set up his uh, camera and just play guitar and make people happy. So he went into his garage and he started his show, which originally called Corona Lessons, where he's kind of giving guitar lessons. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a first call Nashville session guy who can play really, really well which I'm not trying to tell you about everything that's in his show. I'm trying to get you to go and watch his show. He changed the name of it, and I'll use one of these shirts that we actually got from Tom, which is called Homeschooling. He goes by more than one name. He goes by Uncle Larry, goes by Little Tommy, goes by Starship Trooper. Goes you know, by, they're just goes having... Goes by Book. Goes by Book. They're yeah. just having fun. His channel is called 501 Chorus Echo, and you can find him on YouTube. Now, who was the other guy that breakfast? Ebo? Ebo. What do you know about Ebo? Ebo has his own company called uh, Ebo Productions, I think, and um, he does a line of spring-based reverb units that are studio quality, like sort of like the best of the best of the best of that. If they're in Nashville uh, sessions and in their studios, and Bukovac uses them too. They have to be really, really good. We um, wanted to visit with Tom Bukovac when we went back to Nashville because of how it related to what it is that we do, which is we talk about vintage guitars and vintage amps and the uh, attributes of using those instruments. And I don't think that there's really hardly anybody better as an example of that over and over and over again in his own show than Tom Bukovac. He plays vintage guitars and he plays them really well, talks about what they do, and you can hear how these instruments sound when somebody of his caliber is playing them. It's really, yeah. really great. So when we go there, though, here's the funny thing about, about this. We go there and we uh, arrange, Pat arranged to have breakfast at, um, Nadine's meeting uh, Bukovac and uh, Ebo, who is his buddy who makes this incredible reverb unit, all that. And we're there with our wives and at the restaurant. And these guys show up. And I tell you, it's like we've known them forever. They immediately were just gracious to us. And the conversation started about music including with our wives, who, of course, are pretty well versed in music because they've been around <laughs> us for a while. <laughs> and everyone was engaged, and it was really, really cool. I, I sort of think that for Tom, I know, the speculation was that he was thinking, let's, you know, let's get together and talk a little bit before we make a commitment to turn a camera on. Because as he says, when you, when, as you'll see in the interview, when you turn the camera on, things change, and he would know. Yeah, well, I got a question for you. Yeah. What was that dish called that we ate? Oh, know, like French fries or something with, I don't know, stew with on gravy top of it. With gravy, yeah, yeah, with some, um, well, it almost was like stuff over, over French fries. Right. 
Oh yeah, it, it was great. But good, and uh, and I think we can thank uh, Ebo for that. Yes, because he is the one who he, super nice guy too. You know, he's kind of the um, well, like Tom had told me that he is the he's actually the number one guy in the United States as far as vintage amplifiers and repairs. So oh yeah, he's he's the man. And um, and he volunteered to you, I think, on a message he sent to you that if you guys get any vintage amps you need to have done send them to me i don't think he just works on them that's right you know, you know just all the time i don't know he's super super he's super nice guy super too. great so then we had a great breakfast and then we went over to his house and here again he br brings out his vintage instruments literally like a ton of them were playing on them yeah talking about them it, it, it's 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 really quite fabulous um on the premise that we're going to interview him right and so we set the camera up like we have the camera set up now on us. As soon as we go into it, he starts interviewing us. <laughs> this is the interview that we did with him, if we can call it an interview, he did with us. And we'll interject some things as we go along um, in it. You know, it's, it's kind of a rare thing when you run into somebody that you really admire their playing. Yeah and you get to spend some time with them and they turn out to be really cool people too yeah you know that's i didn't i didn't detect any kind of egotistical no stuff at all as far as he's concerned at any and, time ever and <clears throat> when you know it comes to his family and all of that man he's he's just a down-to-earth dude that's yeah it was really a treat to be able to have access to him and we thank him, and we'll thank him again yep. um, for letting us into his life for this brief amount of time. So this is uh, uh, Road Trip Nashville, Part 1, The Amazing Tom Bukovac. All right. We're rolling? We're rolling. Welcome to Nashville. God, it's exciting here. Uh, I love your huge pool in the back. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the rolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the, are those pool girls out there? You hire them yeah, to take yeah. care of them? And, and, and you saw Juan out there that takes care of her. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You guys came here at the right time of year. It's This is the first couple of days of insanely perfect weather it we've had. Perfect. And uh, up until this point, it was fucking miserably hot. And, and this is the time of year that I live for. To uh, I wait all summer, suffer through summer, waiting for this, these days. And what's football got to do with yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, uh, every, all my kids are the same way. It's just everything fall. Uh, even all, even all the, way, all the way down to this, which is my kids' favorite pumpkin spice candles that they love so much. Mm, they give you a thousand dollars. Yeah. They all say, Dad, that's the best candle because Mom uses oh. those. You know? ah, and it's nice. all those things that remind them of fall. So, Evo, when we were talking to him, yeah, we, we all, asked him the same question. We all had breakfast this morning. And he said, uh, yeah. he said, we said uh, the summer's really hot here. And he goes, oh, it's maybe torturous. a couple days. So that's, that's what, what he said. Torturous. You gotta have a hat if you want to be on the show. I know you guys are right. used to seeing me in a hat, but yeah. they were right. kind enough to bring this nice hat for me. I thought, hell, this is this the time to wear it. I don't usually wear hats. No, but this is a, this is quite a moment for me. Well, also, it's, it's the time of year. It's it changes the way you hear. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think. It, it, yeah, uh, it does it change the way you play? I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, what did you, you think of our breakfast place this morning? Um, I had the biggest breakfast that they make. And it was staggering. It's pretty good, right? But it was inspiring to you for to get some of that country uh, yeah, ham. country ham. Which, you liked that, didn't you? The sweet gal is over there off camera. Uh, what did you guys have? Delicious salsa on my eggs. Uh, I can't remember. It was green salsa. What was it called? The pile? Green chili salsa. The bump? Well, Homemade. whatever I ate, it was a huge pile of delicious The bump? Food. Is that what you had? What was it called? The crunch? <laughs> I don't know. What, had a name. What, what were the fries with the gravy on them? <laughs> yeah, that's called poutine. 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 That was good. Poutine. That was good. Poutine. 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 Well, anyway, welcome to my bachelor pad kitchen. I know this, this house is a little messy. But yeah, we, we do the best we can here. Uh, baseball cards, you can't see them in the camera, but baseball oh, or football cards and all that. This is this is where you shoot the videos yeah. right here. Yeah. 
And you have a phone, your phone on some kind of little holder? Yeah, I just use, I set it up against this uh, this piece of wood, and this is what, I mean, when we play cards with the kids, they put their cards in here. Oh, you know, yeah. And Marshall has his name yeah, he's on his Yeah, <laughs> Leo's got his own too. So that's where you're getting all the your fancy camera stand stuff from. Well, the main thing that you see, though, when you do your videos, you see... Uh, Parts of the plant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Jimmy Brown, who's my favorite Jimmy, football player yeah. right. all the time. And uh, here's a picture uh, that the, the kids might enjoy. Give them a close-up of that. Homecoming, 1986. With Angela McChesney from my high school. Oh, really? Angela? She Check that out, guys. Look at that picture. I love the fact that Tony refrigerated. <laughs> um, let's talk about records. Okay. You make them. Well, yeah, but, but let's talk the ones, the ones we like. What ones do you like? What do you like? Probably one of the most influential ones for me, not playing, but just got my attention, was Are You Experienced, Jimi Hendrix? Yeah. It, it like I just yeah, I I, So I had a guitar, yeah. and I got my guitar out, and I couldn't find one note. Yeah. That he was playing. Of course, you I did not play. You got good hands, man. I just saw you playing that shit a minute ago. You well, you're a nice hands, guy. Man. You do. Uh, and you know, he's got two of them. You, he's got two of them. He's got two of those uh, hands. Man, it's uh, it's so funny. You can tell so much about somebody just by the way they touch guitar. Isn't that, isn't that funny? It is. Like I was, I've talked about it in my in my videos. Like I don't even have to have the sound up. I could be watching a video of somebody playing guitar with the sound down, and I can tell. Instantly, if they can play or not. Yeah. You can yeah. just see it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a certain confidence of yes. repetition yes. that comes about. I was probably a sucker for uh, sweet vibratos yeah. when I heard Clapton, yeah. that vibrato, and that was really big. And that, yeah. I spent most of my time trying to get that down, and I'm still you working got it. on it. And you play very quietly, I noticed you play very well, I'm timid and I'm shy. Why are you so shy? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sensitive. <laughs> It's his wife. <laughs> She's over here. Like, oh, but you got, person. I know you got, you got big old tone in there. You're just holding it back. You're holding it back. Well, and you can't use the tip of your pick. Did you know that? Uh -huh, I heard that. Yeah, I heard you, that. If you use the side of the pick, you get a lot more tone. You get a lot of tone out of that. It's cool doing an episode in a hat. The what? It's oh, yeah. cool doing an episode in yeah, a hat. It, it gives you a whole different perspective. Tell, tell us about how difficult it was to find this hat, you said. I found this hat years ago, and... Uh, um, they discontinued them uh, mm -hmm. about about 10 or 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and so I've been looking ever since for another one. Is there and a brand? It's it's called. Um, what, what's it called? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but here, let's see. Can you see it on here? Is there a brand on there? I don't. I, I don't have it's, glasses. It's one's right there. Yeah. Polar Tech. Echo engineering, which probably means that it's beneficial for the environment. Yes. Also. Then there's another little tag on it that says something on the side. It says, for losers. Oh, no, that's not right. <laughs> it says, polar tech. Okay. So it says, polar tech on each side. Put it back on me and just arrange it just right. Like, like make it like so this. Okay, so is this the back? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What do you think about that's the That's adjustable back there. Oh, yeah. I didn't even see it. Well, you know, they put it right on your yeah. yeah. pepper. Wow, kind of scary stuff. They took about 10 pounds out. Yeah, all right. Let's see. Get I, it going. Ready? I think. This is it. This is it. Two. Look at that. Just make it look nice. Okay, okay. we got to get this guy. Yeah, make it look nice. Yeah. Get my hair right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. There we go. Okay. I love this one. Well, you've got to have that slightly yeah. Yeah. rugged thing yeah. to, to be yeah. Uncle Larry, you know. Yeah. That's the way that goes. Yeah. What are we drinking today? We got some beers, which you were kind enough to bring along. Thanks for that. And that Drove all the way from Portland, yeah? All the way from Portland, a road trip. You know, and it, it's not so much the destination, but it's the trip to get here. Right. And it's kind of like a lot of that stuff. And so. Yeah. You know, you get on an airplane and you got all these other things to worry about, like your plane going. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that's what seatbelts are for. Well, that's true. Oh, you crash in an airplane yeah. with a seatbelt, you got a better chance of walking out of that crash than if you don't have a seatbelt. Says right? who? Well, isn't that true? It's a seatbelt company. <laughs> you know, this is the most I've ever seen you talk on one of your episodes. <laughs> Me? Yes. <laughs> oh, I get a little bit chatty. <laughs> you know what I've been watching lately? I, I, uh, 
well, I, I watch lots of crime shows, you know, forensic files. But lately, in honor of 9-11, uh, uh, I've been watching every damn YouTube video I can about 9-11. There's so much amazing stuff on there, 60 Minutes do documentaries. Yeah. I learned so much about that horrible day in the last couple of days. I probably watched too much of it. It really started to bring me down a little bit. Man, what a thing those people went through. Holy shit. You know, and they're still feeling the aftermath. Oh my God. I mean, that was the freakiest thing that could have ever happened, man. You know? Mm. You remember where you were when it happened? I do. Well, where, where were we, dear? We were in Ashland. Did that happen? No, we weren't, were we? I was we, working at the naturopathic uh, medicine place. Okay, we just moved back to Portland area. So, what yeah. are you guys doing in Nashville? Why are you here? We're here for you, Tom. Oh, come on. Seriously. Must we be came nice. here uh, specifically to see at least four different people who were yeah. doing music stuff. And we wanted to see you because you're into vintage guitars. Thanks for showing us your vintage guitars. But also when you play them, you bring out the best in vintage guitars. And so we talk about you a lot on our show. We thought, well, let's see if he's a jerk or not. Because, you know, he likes good beer, but that doesn't mean anything. Well, I've yeah, certainly proven that part. I'm yeah. definitely a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I think you owe an apology to, yeah. to uh, uh, what's that guy's name? All the people I've told the fuck off. Yeah, all those people. All, all I mean, the people I've had to block. Is every, you know? Dilly dilly. Early mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. in the thing. Dilly. And then the next show you did yeah. was Blues and Dilly. I go, oh my god. We mentioned something a little bit that we run into and anybody that does a YouTube show is going to run into and that is trolls. People who are so stupid they got nothing else to do but to break into your house when you're having a meeting with 80,000 people and be stupid. And Tom Rant runs into this. He comments on this just a little bit right here. Ah, whatever. I mean, that's only about... So I didn't know about the 80-20 rule until I started doing this. Yeah. If somebody would have told me that early on, it would have been a lot easier. But uh, it's all just... Uh, see, like, you could play Abbey Road for 10 people, and there's going to be somebody that doesn't like it. Right. Right. And uh, right. I'm not comparing myself to Abbey Road by any stretch, but I'm just saying there's no accounting for how different everybody's taste is. It's, it, it, it's, it's just because you think it's great, there's no guarantee anybody else is going to like it. Does you know? the uh, YouTube experience for you open up a world that you didn't know about? So much. Yeah. So much. Not only did it open up a world for you, watching it as well as being now a participant in it? My only problem with watching YouTube is that I've, I feel like I've already seen all the great videos. I'm running out of amazing stuff to watch because I, I don't watch TV. Mm. I watch YouTube. How about football? And, 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 and I've seen all my favorite old football videos too many times now and all my favorite documentaries. and uh, I'm sure there's always going to be something to watch, but... Uh, yeah, I get into pretty esoteric weeds. I'm sure you guys do. So you like, yeah. go down in pretty deep wormholes mm -hmm. with the YouTube. Uh, it's 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 such a cool thing. I'll tell you what. I sometimes think about how bummed I would be if somebody if they got rid of YouTube. That would suck. It would suck. It's a major source of information it for is. you. It is relating in your business yeah. now because you have a lot of times where you're filming. Yeah. S studio sessions and things that the ordinary person would never ever get into or like when you recorded with Finn Skill, do you have, find people reacting to you giving that sort of access that is the people well, around that's you that's what they were saying yeah, yeah. Um, the, everyone says where else are we going to be able to see this kind of stuff see I got to be careful when I do that kind of shit too because uh, you know, like we talked about earlier when we were all sitting having dinner and somebody said or having breakfast, somebody, somebody said, but it would have been great to record this conversation. It's like, but it would have changed the conversation. As yeah. soon as the camera's involved, it's like another person. Yeah, it is. And, and uh, it puts an instant governor on everything. And uh, so I've got to be really careful when I ever drag that thing into a session. Like, I never want to kill a vibe because, you know, this, this, this sacred 
sort of uh, the the studio is very uh, there's a lot of etiquette involved in there and, and I never want to be that that guy that kills a vibe but hey guys might have we film this so I try to do all that in a way that that never disrupts the flow and doesn't piss anybody off you know I try to sh but you really what I've learned is that you really no one could ever show anybody the real studio experience there's no way to film it yeah. because because here's there's a couple of reasons why the real magic of the studio is when people are fishing and trying to find parts and the tracks come together but you can't really film that because because uh, no artist wants their music to be seen when it's in that infantile of the stage like even if it was my record and it was my channel I would be a little weird about letting some of the early footage go out when it's all being put together. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it's so crude. But that is where the real magic of the studio is. Tim, Tim Pierce and I talked about that. Like, if you could somehow capture that shit and show people that part, it would be amazing. But no mm -hmm. one ever could. It's like a ghost. It can't be filmed. It's, it's, no artist wants their music seen like that. So you could be really good friends with an artist and say, man, you mind if I roll some tape while we're doing this? No, they don't want that. Nobody wants that. So you can't really film the good shit. All you can do is after the track's over with, walk around, here, here's the studio right. that we did all the magic in that you that couldn't film. You know, so there's all that. And, and I really wish I could figure out a way to somehow to capture some of that real shit. But I don't think I ever could, you know. So interesting thing is that he said is uh, that you almost can't film that. That is, you can't film that creative process in there. But it kind of makes us wonder, well, how about let it be? Was that like a miraculous thing or what? It, it was. And that was probably the most appealing thing to me about that whole series. Of, how about of when they argue, they though? All of it. When they argue, when, when, when George is trying to show Ringo how to play Octopus's Garden or whatever tune that was, and working that out and seeing the mistakes they're making. and On camera. Know, on camera. On the camera. most famous group in the world, on camera. They're so I guess they're so used to being on camera that it's just another day. I mean, Paul comes in, John's not there yet, and, he, and the three of them, and he starts kind of hammering some chords on his bass that are going to end up being get back. Mm -hmm. Right, r I mean that. If that's of interest, that to me is like that same kind of a deal. Except it's the most popular group in the world. Yeah, it's such a dig when you're in there. Everybody's digging so hard, reaching inside themselves, trying to find something to play, trying to create something that uh, just a camera roll would ruin that. Yeah, it's very personal. It's just like an exorcism mm -hmm. when you're in there. Trying to you feel, is there a pressure? No, dude. There's a pressure. It, I don't care how long you've been doing this shit. It's always pressure. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. i played on 1,300 records so far. And, and, if, and if that, and, and even after all that, you think I could just walk in there and just, you know, piss it all off. I, I can't do that. I have to always be on. And it's like, it's, and even when you're working with people, you work with a million times. You could think, wow, this guy's heard me on some of my best days. He's going to just, I don't really have to prove myself again today, do I? But if you start slipping one bit, people notice it. It's pretty weird. Uh, and, and, but the, the, whole, the whole real part of it is that any real pro, you got to suffer all that, but still make it seem like a joke. You can't take it seriously. Right. You can't take it personally. You got to no. be a pro. Yeah, you you like you have to make it look like all that shit you're suffering through is, is a joke. That's the thing. That's you what all the great. So you do. can't necessarily be completely invested in an idea. Yeah. And, when that yeah, when yeah. all of a sudden that idea isn't going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well. Yeah. And, and it's you know and there's there's a little bit of lobbying campaigning going on like, you know, I always equate it to this like you know. I don't want to worry about what someone's doing. If they're doing me a service, I want them to be completely confident that they're, they know what the fuck they're doing. Like, for example, if I said, if I said, hey man, I need a roof on this house, and some guy comes over, and uh, I, all I want that guy to say is, I'm gonna put a badass roof on this house, it's gonna be really nice when it's done. I'd be like, good. <laughs> How much money do I have to give? Here's the check. If somebody comes over and says, I think I can, 
think I can do it. Um, it's going to be hard, but I think I can, you know, I don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. Same thing with these people that hire you for sessions. They don't want to worry about you. If they sense that you're not sure about what you're doing, they're not sure about what you're doing. Yeah. They don't want anyone questioning anything. Like, like, people sense that shit so intensely too. You and they're, you're playing something, they're looking at your body language, they're like, they, they don't know if they like what you just played or not, but if you liked it, they, they're like, yeah, that's the part, you're cool, next part. Yeah. But man, if, because I've been through stages, you know, in different parts of my life when I wasn't in a great place, you know, for whatever reason, and I was not super confident, and they, people can pick up on that. They're just like, once they see you doing that, they're like, man, can we listen back to that? <laughs> Man, I don't know. There's certain you know, verbiage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, yeah. Uh, instead of just going, cool, next song. Yeah. They're like, Man, let's check that out. If they if they sense you're not loving it. Or, you know, or, or drifting. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. It's, 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 it's tricky. Because, um, you know, the whole thing about being a session player is you can never get too excited about anything. Even if you're playing on the White Album, you have to act like it's nothing. That's, that's the whole, because if anybody comes in there, I get like, man, this is amazing, isn't it? Everyone's like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> get him out of here. Right, newbie or something. Yeah, it's like, it's like, it'd be like, uh, that's why I, I get a little freaked out sometimes when I, uh, when I watch the NFL, as much as I love it dearly. I do have issue with these guys. The, the team's losing 28 to, 28 to 3. And they might get an interception or something, and they celebrate like it's a Super Bowl, and they're down twenty-eight to three. Right. It's like uh, my favorite players are the guys like Nick Chubb, who will make an amazing play, run the ball in the end zone, and just quietly gets up and hands the ball to the ref. How much money is the guy getting paid to do that job? He's oh, supposed man. to do that job. I, know, I feel the job. same way. About it's it. like you watch these old films, and, and like I watch a lot of '60s games, yeah. NFL games. You can watch full games on YouTube. Like you can just pick a week, week ten, 1967, Lions against the Bears. You can watch the whole game, and uh, the guys will make amazing plays. And they, and they get up at the end. Of the, you might get one pat on the butt. Uh -huh. They just walk right back to the hole. Uh -huh. It's amazing. Uh -huh. That's how it should be. I know. That. I, That's I, how it be. I completely agree with that. Yeah, That's your it's job. That you're supposed to be come in. Actually, you're the one who's supposed before. to bring in the magic. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's a phenomenal event when you do. No. It's it's that you're supposed to do that, and to that be. would be the guy that you would want to hire the next time. Exactly. And that guy would would be you. Johnny, so how about Johnny how about, Unitas? Johnny Unitas. Johnny Unitas. That's right. Lenny Moore. Right. Right. That's right. Y in the end zone with one hand, and I said, "You need a beer." I do. Why a Tilly? I got him right here. Yeah. I got him right here. Anybody else want a beer? Sure. So Boom. unfortunately, <laughs> we are almost at the time where you have to leave. Uh, I'm, I got about. Uh, Five. I got, no, I can go to three. We can do another few minutes if you like. How about, how about your YouTube life outside of YouTube? Do you get recognized when you watch YouTube around? is all I have left. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say that. I told you he didn't want to hear that. Without YouTube, I'm just lonely, You're just man. doing nothing, are you? No, that's the thing that's funny about, like, uh, <laughs> I just love that. Like, um, I don't know. Uh, I feel like there's there's a. Uh, I don't know. How to, I never want to be known as a YouTuber. I'm sorry. Uh, not to offend anyone. It's, I feel like Happy Gilmore, when he he's recognized as being a golfer, but he hated golf, and he, and he really thought of himself as a hockey player. And everybody says, "Man, you're great at you're great at golf." And he's like, "No, I'm not. I'm a hockey player." And see, like I, everyone says, "Oh, you're a YouTube guitar player." Yes, I make YouTube videos, but that is not. I'm a session guy. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a. That's what I. That's what I do. Rick Beato told me one time. He goes, "Man, you don't ever have to do sessions again if you take this YouTube." And I'm like, "Dude, I would rather be down in the pit fighting with the snakes than be up at the top of the pit talking about what it's like down there." That's what I'm. Yeah, you're that's a session, you're, you're session you're guy. And he was like saying, "You don't have to do sessions anymore." I'm like, "Dude, I don't do sessions because I need the money." That's what I. That's that's what I do. Yeah. You know, and uh, he was like. Yeah, but you could just do this YouTube thing full time. You're a natural. And I said he called me right when I first started this channel, and uh, I don't even know how he got my number. But he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a lovely guy. You know, he's given me all kind of great advice about ways that I could capitalize on my channel and stuff. You know, if you just did this and just make tons of money, and 
he's right about all of it. He's really good at, at working that angle. But the only thing that bothers me is that is this like, I don't ever want it to come across like I'm trying to do this, because it, it's it, it, if this was my only source of income, you know, yeah, I would do some of that stuff. He would say things like, you know, what you got to do is, uh, you know, hire some kid to tab out all your opening loops and sell it as a PDF, thirty nine ninety five, whatever. That would work, mm -hmm. sure, sure. That would be fine. Uh, I'm sure somebody would buy that or whatever. But I just, I don't like the way that feels. You know, I don't ever want to ask anyone to subscribe or put up a fucking clickbait thumbnail. I'm not doing that. And I'm, that's no slight against it. England does, because I realize that's how you get views. Different styles. It works. It certainly works. Hmm. You know, uh, and, and I know that's the game. That's how you play the game. I know that. I'm just, I just don't want it to be like that. Because, you know, if I needed that money, I would do, probably do some of that shit, you know? Yeah. But I, I, YouTube to me is, is, is just, uh, it's just, all it is is an extra little outlet for me. I, the, what it's given me more than anything is a vehicle to do something with all these little riffs and stuff that I come up with. Because in the old days, in the first 50 years of my life, <laughs> I was still writing all these things, but no one ever hear them, because I would just forget them. I never recorded them. So 50 years of coming up with crazy riffs but I never recorded any of them. I, you know, everyone was like, you should make a solo album. I never did. I was, they still you know, say that. And even though you yeah, have. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, now I come up with little riffs and at least they're recorded somewhere. Yeah. And somebody could get something out of it. If they like it, they could learn it. You know, uh, some of the little riffs I make up come, become parts of later albums, you know. Like this, this uh, uh, the new Ann Wilson record that just came out. Mm -hmm. I'd like to actually talk about that for two seconds. Yeah. Um, we would love that. Uh, it just, it's coming out in uh, a couple days. And uh, I had quit the band by the time the record was, was getting finished. We were pretty much, we were probably good three quarters of the way through it. And I quit the band only because, not for no personal reason, I just can't tour anymore. Mm -hmm. I just can't do that. So they brought in another guitar player that is cool to tour and he's great. And uh, so he helped them finish the last bit of the record. but. But most of it was stuff, you know, that we had already had in the can. I wrote a lot of the tunes, a lot of the main riffs that ended up becoming the songs, you know. And some of them were taken from the YouTube channel. Hmm. Like, we would say, what do we want to work on today? Ann's got, anybody got any ideas? I'd be like, well, how about this? And I'd play her a YouTube clip. She'd say, I love that. Let's do that. Let's work on that. And so we would, she would come and she's got this little beautiful lyric book that she was handwritten. It's probably, it's beautiful. And she's got great handwriting. She's a sweet, sweet person, by the way. She's just lovely. Yeah, you've met her a number of times, I think. I mean, I, I mean, we worked together a lot, and never one time, ever, did she was she ever even remotely uncool. Never once. Mm -hmm. We we went through these horrible, you know, road situations, long days of painful rehearsal. Never pulls a diva card ever. Mm -hmm. She's cool. So you know, I. I was I was thinking, boy, that record probably getting fun, like getting done. You know, I'd like to hear it. You know, um, and sure enough, the next day it showed up in the mail. They sent somebody at the office sent me a CD, and it, it was funny because I actually was, was thinking about trying to find it somewhere. And uh, I listened to it last night, and uh, man, a lot of thoughts, a lot of memories. Man, there was a, uh, it's a good record. Uh, there's some really good shit on there, man. Um, because at the time, that band was really digging for something. And uh, she was unhappy with her previous records because they were all kind of thrown together, you know, some of the stuff she's done lately. Even that record that came out, Fierce Bliss, that came out was kind of just cobbled together, like half done ideas. But this new record is like complete thoughts. And there's a lot of soul into it, man. People were really trying hard. Do you think that's you know, because of the band? That yeah, we were we were trying to prove to each other that we could make a badass record. And man, it's I'm not saying the whole thing is amazing, because no record can say that really. But there's some really good shit on there. Excellent. The opening track, there's about four or five tracks on there that are fucking badass. I think anybody would like them. And you know, I'm a pretty harsh critic, man. I rarely like anything, and uh, especially something I played on. 
I rarely like. Well, that must be a problem since you've done. I don't know why I'm like that. It's, if somebody else plays it, it's more valid to me. If so, as soon as I'm playing on it, I just immediately hate it. Everybody's like that, though. Yeah. Most people are like that. But I, so. I'm, I definitely am excited about this new record that's coming out with Guthrie, though. Um, we, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we could launch the thing tomorrow, but um, his management wants to wait for the right time. They How want to get come about that, yeah. that. I mean, I know you know him because yeah, a, he's a dear friend, man. Yeah. I have nothing but respect for that guy. He's a fucking badass man. We're completely different players. Yeah, and we have a totally different style and approach. But man, we get together and write tunes, and it works. And uh, you know, I think we're able to, you know, yin and yang ourselves into some good shit. You know, mm. but. Uh, they want to wait till the right time. I want to put it out right now. I'm ready to go. I mean, it's. I'm proud of it. I, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to move Neil a little bit in the guitar world. I mean, it's because uh, it's uh, it's fresh, man. It it doesn't sound like labored over. Uh -huh. It's like, pretty loose, like and it's uh, it up yeah. Right. It's like we didn't. I purposely didn't try to overproduce it and fix too much shit. You know, I left some imperfections on there because that's my favorite. Are you the producer? Well, I mean, yeah, pretty much. I mean, we both threw out a lot of ideas, but, you know, Guthrie's more of like a, he, he, he's more comfortable as a player. Mm -hmm. He's a wild man. He's like giving the ball to Barry Sanders. You just never know what he's going to do. He, he's so unpredictable. It's like totally free. So you can just go, man, just play some shit. He'll play some crazy shit. You know, sometimes they'll just, the solo's about to end and he's still going, you know? And it's like, so you gotta reel him in a little bit. Like, I'm pretty good at taking his idea and go, all right, great, you just gotta figure out a way to dismount the solo. You know, and he's great, he'll say, what do you want me to do? All right, try this, you know? But his ideas and his, um, his, uh, man, he's just got a, well, that's what I look for in guitar players, freedom. He's got so much freedom in his playing. It's like, he's, uh, he's likely to do damn near anything at any given moment. I'm a little more calculated than him. Like, he plays a lot with, in free time, you know? I'm more like a, I stick with a motif and I sort of, I'm a very rhythmic player. Mm -hmm. um, my whole, all of my melodic ideas and stuff are very rhythmically oriented. He's like super loose, man. He's like, his time is all over the place in a good way. I don't mean like he can't play in time. I mean, he's, he experiments with, really weird, you know, sort of in and out things in time. And that's really cool for me to listen to. I, Does he do a lot of session work here? He he never could could get used to it. He he tried for a while to be a session guy. It's just not his style. Yeah. He never liked it. Uh, he never felt comfortable doing it. He'd tell you that straight up. Well, it sounds like that on his YouTube channel. Yeah. He, has a, he has a channel yeah. and I've watched him a number of times. Yeah. And he plays some really interesting things. And maybe for you, I mean, when you play, you sound like your record ready. I mean, that is, you have a lot of harmonic, great ideas you, that are man. exciting and hookish that you just do. It's, it's just what it Thanks. is. Yeah. Um, you know, man, it's just, you know, the, you can't hide from the fact that I've been doing this for a long time. I should be permanently have headphones on, sewed on. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, But man, you know, I, I've learned a lot over these years of being, of being in the studio constantly. I've worked with some of the best producers in the world. I've watched the way they make records. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody makes the records differently. And I just love to soak it in, man. So Watch when, do. when do you have time to practice? All the time. Do you practice all the time? Play, practice yeah, at home get home all from the work. time? Yeah, I love the play guitar. It hasn't dwindled at all. I keep waiting for the day when like, when I'm just like bored of it and not want to play. I've been doing this a long time. Yeah. But I'll come home from a long day of sessions. Not every time, but I'll come home from a long day. If I don't have the kids, I'll sit and play all night. It's weird. Because most guys my age do not practice. Oh, you're so old. Yeah. You know, 54, you know. Yeah, yeah we, don't, you know, we, don't want, we don't want to talk about mm -hmm. it. Most guys don't practice. They've done all their practice, you know. What are you playing there? Oh, I've got this. Uh... You know that chord?
know, these were these were uh, poor man's guitars. Oh, no. Yeah. Back but they the were days. still American yeah. made in the Did you know that Silvertone as a company never made a single instrument? Of course Did you know, know that it was a brand. It's just a brand name. Yeah. yeah. Everything that's ever been branded Silvertone was was made by either K, Harmony, Tysco, or Dan Electro. No, no, there was never a Silvertone factory that no. made Silvertone instruments. People think that that Silvertone was a brand. This is a Harmony. Yeah, rebranded exactly. Silvertone. It's light. This is a K, because actually K actually made their own guitars. Yeah. And uh, I think they were both made in Chicago, right? Is I, think so. Chicago? I think so. Yeah. I think so. So, uh, Burkett, I think I saw something that he is not doing this as much. Well, he's funny about that. He, he'll he'll say things like, I said, ah, oh, Tom, I appreciate all the help you're sending people my way and stuff, but I, I can't keep up. And then he'll call me later and go, yeah, if you got any orders, uh, let me know. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, he's a funny one. Uh, he does... I never met him in person, we just talked on the phone. Nice guy. Great work. I mean, undeniable. Great shit he does. It's so, just so wild. But, you know, like, he'll say things like, I, I sold one to Dan Huff, one of his guitars. And he, and he was, when he found out that Dan's Dan playing one of the guitars, he was proud as a little, yeah. like a... Like He's a, got a picture. <laughs> yeah. Me a picture. Yeah, and of course he would be, because Dan Huff's a badass. Yeah. And, um, but, like, he, he, does, he is concerned about who's playing the guitar. But I will say, dude, Every guy on the current Nashville session scene that's doing anything is playing one of those guitars. Everyone I know, all the heavy hitter acoustic players are playing those guitars. Uh, with other stuff. Yeah. But they all have one of those. Yeah. Everybody. How about the uh, rubber bridge? Thing uh, that's that's yeah, that, that, that got hot for a minute, but that's already like passe. Is it already yeah, gone? That's already gone. <laughs> uh, you know, but that got hot for a minute. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those phases that sort of, you know. Blake Mills sort of brought that in for a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm a big fan of him, by the way. He's uh, a badass. Uh, um, but, you know, the mute thing is always going to be cool. Um, as a matter of fact, you, you might remember in one of my videos, I had this... Uh, you seem to have watched a few of them. I've watched them yeah. uh, From day one. Uh, thank you, man. Uh, you must be extremely bored. Uh, but, uh, not anymore. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, man, how cool would it be if somebody... Um, was able to um, take a, let's say, a Telecaster, okay? And I love the covers, right? No one ever uses them, but yeah. I love them. What if you had a cover that you could put on that thing, and the cover had six screws, and you could individually adjust the mutes on each string? Hmm. Because any guitar that has a mute, whether it be an old Jaguar or a Gretsch, mm -hmm. the mutes never work right. You, you crank the mute on, and you got Half too much half. mute on yeah. the E and the A. Yeah, they're like flat. And the G's not getting muted at all. The foam's all worn out. Yeah. Shit's all fucked up. <laughs> uh, if you had an adjustable mute for each string, hmm. you could do it on Les Paul. You could take a a little piece that just slips right over the tunematic and has six adjustable screws where it's like little use those mutes like they use like the best mutes for bass all the bass guys always say is the best mutes are like those woman's uh, makeup you know those little pads oh, they come with the yeah. what are they called? Q-tip Q-tips? Oh, yeah, yeah they're, they're oval but shaped it's, 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 yeah. it's in the makeup thing you yeah. rub it in there and you rub yeah. it yeah. Right. those are the best material apparently for uh. For muting bass strings to make it sound really rich, you know. How did they find that out? Well, you try it. Well, you yeah, try it. You try it. You yeah, try it. I mean, you see, like, try everything. Yeah. People, like mm -hmm. I run cloth underneath the yeah. strings in the back to try to get rid of overtones. Right. And right. And right. All that like shit. That. You pick up with a microphone and stuff for acoustic guitar, of course, you pick up every goddamn thing there is yeah. to pick up. Right. I was playing in one session because I was, when I was learning, I was when I was going. Right. Hitting my hands, right, right. And they go, what, what is going on? That? Yeah. I go, I don't know. How long have I been doing that? Oh, oh I don't know. Twenty-five years, right. and oh, now, dude. right now, I have to change. Oh, 
<laughs> the, the studio is born to show every weakness we have. Yeah. Everything wrong with your playing will be magnified bigger than you could ever imagine. Yeah. There's a lot of drummers that suffer from, from like this, this uh, there's some professional drummers who, who are on some big records that have a problem of unintentional ghost notes happening on their bass drum. Yeah. Um, you know, like the pedal hits and there's a tiny bit of almost inaudible bounce back, right. and you can you can with with the, the, the intense microscope with the, what's going on with the microphones, uh, they'll go to mix the record, and you can't get those little ghost tones out of there. They're like it's too hmm. it's so like it's it, everything like when you're playing the guitar, every piece of jewelry, anything you got. I mean, I I work on lots of records with like you know. Artists and wear lots of make or uh, you know hip hipster sure. stuff. They come in. Like, I'll do. I'll do an acoustic Money. track. I'll do some acoustic. And it's like it sounds like this. You know when they're playing. It's like, you know, while they're trying to play. You know. Yeah. And it's like what's that noise? It's like dude. It's the fucking you know eighteen bracelets. You're right. Playing. Not to mention a lot of people don't even know how to play guitar with a beat. Like, this yeah. hitting that shit. Yeah. You gotta be. You can't. Even, you know when you're really playing. You shouldn't even have your arm on the guitar. You should, you know, like real players, they got so little with their arm on the guitar, they don't want to mute any of this shit. This is your drumming. Right. And so all that stuff, you know, people that don't know how to play guitar, it's, it's funny. I can play, the artist would be like, I think I can play acoustic on this one. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, man, cool. You ever play with a click track? No. Oh. Uh, nah, no worries, man. Let's try it out and see how it goes. And then they're like, ah, I can't get my headphones right. You know, something's wrong. Uh, it's like, you know, okay, oh yeah. yeah. Every excuse oh. in the world. Yeah. I know. I, the reason I laugh is because that's been me. You know, mm. when you first go in, the first five years, the first time I ever went in the recording session with it, my little band that yeah. I had when I was 20, I had six 10 inch speakers in a speaker cabinet, and four of them were blown. I didn't even know. <laughs> Try the other speaker. How could you ever talk? Why don't you ever talk? Yeah, what's up with you? Yeah. You get a word in edgewise. <laughs> in fact, I wrote a song about that. <laughs> what's it called? Word I mean, in edgewise. Fuck you, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> what's it called, Chris? Walking and talking. Well, I'm walking, walking and talking yeah. by myself. Okay. Okay. Right. What do you want to talk about? Nobody. Let's get it out there. I just, uh, you know, I I was just curious about your, other than the recording stuff. Yeah. What do you do? I mean, I know you practice guitar, yeah. you play guitar, do you write songs, do you write tunes, do you get together with other people and write bit. stuff? I don't do that. I'll, if I write anything, it's usually by myself, which is because my therapist said I have an avoidant attachment style uh, that I've developed when I was very young, you know, as a way to cope with the world. So I've got a bit of that. And it's hard for me to get together with people and uh, write a song. I can never do that. Yeah, it's, uh, but I don't have many hobbies. I do. I'm into old cars. I like yeah. uh, sports. I like to watch football. But as far as like, and I could I could use a good hobby. <laughs> I really could. If like some, if I could find something that I could get into that wasn't music related, that I would get excited to get out of bed and go do. I would consider that to be a gift. Hmm. Like if I knew how to work on old cars for real, I would just be obsessive about it. But I'm terrible with tools and, and I have no mechanical inclination whatsoever. But I'm fascinated like with people that could do that. If I had a garage with a lift and some proper tools, I would be the first guy out there tearing up an old car. I just don't know anything about it. Right. I've owned a million old cars in my life and know a bunch of mechanics, been around it, I just don't know how to do it. If I could go back and rewind and change my life and it didn't have to do with music, I would have just been a, nothing but an old car mechanic. That's what I would not. That's the only other thing that ever interested me, the way this does. And, you know, it, music is such an all-encompassing thing. There's so many areas that you can immerse yourself in. See, uh, what I was thinking about today was that, you know, there's a lot of people that are lifers, you know, life, life for musicians, right? And I feel like, well, what ends up happening is a lot of them focus, spend their time focusing on stuff like gear and, and studying gear. What I, I, I have done a fair share of that 
but I'm more interested in studying music. That's what I do. And like, I, I can't shut it off. Like, when I listen to songs, there's mechanical calculations going on in there that are frightening. Like, it's, it's like, it's like, uh, so one friend of mine said, it's like when you listen to music, it's like this, your brain is going to be like those computer CAD drawings. That's what happens. I completely disassemble the thing in my mind. Like, I'll put on a record, even a record I've heard a thousand times, and I'll, each time I listen to it, I study one other aspect of it. I'll focus on this this time, and the next time I'll focus on that. I'm, I'm, I don't, people say, yeah, you only like guitar music or something like that. That's the biggest insult in the world to me. I, I, am, I don't even, the guitar is just one element. I'm, I'm more interested in the entire picture. Like, I'm more interested in what the drums are doing, what the bass is doing, what the harmonies are doing, the, what, the, what the engineer mixed it like. I, like, the whole picture is what I'm interested in. If it's got some cool guitar in it, that's great. But I'm not into just guitar music. I like good records. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, like, it's, it's, it's a little, f it's hard for me sometimes to, like, just be normal. Because What's an example of a good record? Just off the top of your oh, head. Oh man, like, you like you I, I, I just flashed to what I've been listening to lately. Uh, like, you know, um, I, I hear records sometimes that are so good that I can't believe human beings made them. You know, there's, there's such brilliant creative ideas put forth in such a unique way. Like for example, just one of a million things. I was laying in bed the other night and I started thinking about that old Steely Dan song, FM. Remember that track? Oh, yeah. So I, I was like, man, I don't know that song. I don't know how to play it. And I, and I get violently mad at myself if there's a song that I don't know the chords to. I have to know. Like, there's, there cannot be a song that I don't know the chords to. It's, that's how my brain works. Like, if, there, if I was at a party and someone said, man, play FM, and I didn't know it, I'd be, like, mad at myself. <laughs> so... Like I study songs, and I and I like if I hear if I'm if I'm driving in a car and I hear someone comes on the radio and a cool chord change goes by and I don't know it, I'll learn it right there. Mm -hmm. I have to know it. So people say you're like a human jukebox. You know, how do you know all these songs and stuff? It's just it all stems from the curiosity of of having to know it. I just I, it, it's an offense to me if a song goes by with a chord change I don't know. So I started listening to, to uh, Student Man uh, FM and I was like you know it it. it Let's just talk about. You remember this song? I do. Yeah. So, you know, they originally wrote it for a movie. There was a movie called FM, and they needed to throw together a song real quick. And all the only rule they had, from what I've read on the internet, is that they had to uh, just make it about radio FM. That was like the only. So Fagan is genius. They were working on. They just got done working on the Asia record. So it was the same core group of musicians that, that was working on that record. Jeff Vaccaro. And basically, Fager and Beck and Becker went into the studio just by themselves and made it FM. And uh, just the the imagery of the lyric, what the way he says, the way he paints a picture of what he's talking about, Fagan was the king of that. I mean, the imagery of his lyrics just astounds me. And that, let's just not even talk about the brilliant chord changes. Yeah and the brilliant sound of the record and how free Walter Becker's guitar playing is on that. He's just like, like making a giant statement over a pretty chill, loungy kind of backing track. Pretty relentless, I mean it opens, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but the chord changes, man, you know, like, you know, uh, let's see. You know, the girls don't seem to care what's on. As long as they play till dawn, and it's like nothing but blues and nails. Somebody else's play song. Very, very jazzy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, taking chords that that are pretty common, you know, and lots of it, but the way he strung together is what made him And the lyric, like you yeah. said, because the lyric creates the mood oh, just dude. as much as anything else. And the sound of the record. Like, there's this big guitar jam at the end, right? And they were so thoughtful and so mature 
uh, in their choices. Like, there's this long guitar solo that goes on for a good while at the end of the tune, and it's genius. But there's a guy playing percussion in conga, but it only comes in like every like four bars. Mm -hmm. Like, there's this blank space, long solo going on, and then all of a sudden, bah, 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 and then it goes away, and then another four bars goes by, and then he comes back in with it. See, most people, when they get a conga, they're going to be playing the through whole, the whole yeah. thing, you know. There's the little things like that, the wisdom of those records, Beatles, Zeppelin and stuff, that stick with me. And, and like the maturity, like they would have little elements that just happen once, you know. See, we're living in the age now where everyone is so proud to come up with a good idea that if they do come up with it, they stick it down your throat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like cheerleading, that's what pop music is now. It's like cheerleading, like, the, like give me a, like a buzzword and a hook and I'm gonna cram it down your throat. Those records were made more like along the lines of like a novel, where, where if somebody had a br brilliant idea, they would save it for the end of the tune and like surprise you with it. So when it hits you, it's like a fucking, you know. You know, it's, it's, it's just, that's what I love about those records. And I feel like uh, that's what makes them timeless, you know. I get welled up just thinking about it. I know, you know? I know. Yeah. And also, with you as a, as an experienced session guy, I would think when you hear that stuff, you can go back in time and listen to it and hear something new again oh, that you missed. Time. Like how many times you go back and just go, are you kidding me? Like they put Man. something going on and they go, that rule just got tossed out the window. You Amazing. can do that. Oh, dude, it makes me weepy because I miss yeah. it so bad. I, know. I, I, I hate what music has become. I really do. And I just, mm -hmm. I hate to even say that. Uh, and I feel like an old guy when I say that, but I just wish that some of that creativity would come back. You yeah. say you say a number of times, look in the camera and go, remember when so and so <laughs> scores? <laughs> God. Yeah. Just some wisdom in records. I know. Yeah, that's all I want. I mean, why does everything have to be so childish? I know. Amateur. It's, it's like, stupid. It, it's like, yes, there are still people making great records. I don't mean to make a blanket statement that just sounds like some ancient guy. Things were better back in my day. But man, I don't think I think even a child could see. Like when I when I play those records for my boys, they get they love it. That that's amazing. They they there's no time stamp on that shit. They hear they hear that and they're like, this is better than pop music. You know, they know it. You know, it's like and I was like uh, at first when they were real young, I kind of pushed it on them a little bit because I wanted them to know the classics. But now. It's, it's like they just want that music, man. That's what they want. And uh, it's great. You know, you're driving around in the car, and my seven year old says, Dad, play the Grand Parade of Lifeless Packaging, which is an album cut on Lamas Down and Broadway, Genesis Record. I mean, how many <laughs> seven year olds are walking around? Nobody. There are no shit. seven year olds that say <laughs> no. saying that. Mm hmm. Is that thing still rolling? Uh, I have a big, huge memory card. Oh, great. Yeah, I changed it. I got... I've heard about your memory card. Yeah. Yeah. It has a memory thing inside, but then I got the big memory cards that would triple the amount of time. Wow. Was. But that was an expensive upgrade. No, they're not. Nice. They're yeah. nothing. They're like 15 bucks. Oh. And you get three hours of HD video on nice. this side. Anything you lovely ladies off screen would like to ask the group? Any questions over there? Anything? Just enjoy the conversation. Yeah. This is well, okay. great lessons. I'm afraid you're going to run out of time. Yeah, I better go get my kids. i got to get them to school. But it's been lovely having you guys over. Thanks for coming over to my bachelor pad. Well, we want to thank Uncle Larry again for uh, a great time and allowing us into his life for a while. It was uh, educational and it was really fun. And he was really nice to our wives. Um, asked them some questions, you know. Mm -hmm. He was just uh, having breakfast with them and all that. So we're going to do a shameless plug for him. Uh, besides the fact that he's recorded thousands of records, uh, he also has a couple uh, records for sale through, through his website that uh, are him. So one of them is uh, the thing that he did at, with a, a guitar player from Stone Temple Pilots named uh, Dean DeLeo. It's called Trip the Witch, and you can get this through his website. The second one is called Plexi Soul, which is a great name. Um, and this, all the songs are written by Tom. A cool thing about this, this, this one, we'll talk about these two, and, and uh, 
I think we're in agreement on this. Plexi Soul is more about Tom as a guitar player. I, to me, it, it's a, a, um, a lesson in um, uh, tasteful guitar playing. You're not going to hear all kinds of guitar acrobatics and, and different different things like that. It's Everything is real melodic. The tone, um, just everything. Uh, when to play what and don't play too much. Yep. And when when's the time to play a bunch. So. It's the book. It is, it is. That's And yeah, the, the tones. That's, He's got great tone. He's got great tone and it changes even in the song. So that's a great great lesson for that. Well, you that's could, that's because he uses the side of the pick. And Remember you can that? also get into that's picks. Right. That's right. Get into picks. And we'll talk more about picks in the next Nashville show when we talk about uh, Vinny and V picks. Vinny Smith. The other one, Trip the Witch, that he did with Dean, this is a textural record. And for me, it feels almost as if this is like a gateway looking into what a really great sounding musical track would sound like if somebody wasn't singing. It's it's yeah. it's not as solo oriented as this. It's texture oriented and it's also the book on what you can do in a song with different chord changes and stuff like that. There is one song called Saturn We Miss You that has John Anderson from Yes on it that uh, Uncle Larry was really proud of. Anyway, they're both available and a must listen. Gots to have them. Yeah. So the next thing we're going to do is Nashville, The Road Trip, Part 2, where we'll be talking about the music stores, um, V-Pix we went to, um, <laughs> just a lot of interesting things food. about Nashville. Yeah. Our little our trip there. The food. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's barbecue, chicken. If you don't have the barbecue. What's the name of that chicken, chicken place? Hades, Haley's Chicken, Eddie's Chicken, whatever it is. I think it's called Chicken World. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's the food, food capital of the world. Yeah, yeah. So stay tuned for that, and we will uh, continue the fun. We gave Tom one of these hats. I know. When we were there, and he wore it in the show. He did, as you can see. He did, and. Um, yeah, I don't know whether you know it or not, but he actually plays better when he's wearing that hat. He sounded much and better, finally. Yeah, finally. Yeah, it's about time. <laughs> but uh, the hats are very rare. And, and How Tom, rare are and they? And Tom, if, if you're watching this, uh, they are extremely rare. It took me, I bought this hat about 20 years, 15, 20 years ago, probably. Yeah. And um, they don't make them anymore and haven't made them for years. It's woven actually now you can buy one if you can find one now most of them that you find are, are pure polyester Ugh. nobody yeah. wants that no oh geez nobody i know yeah i mean so you got to have the road they, one yeah. and there's a little tag on it that says shred alert which make them extremely rare mm -hmm. and they're made in actually hood river oregon yeah, believe that. That's an hour outside of Portland. That's right. That's right. Up to Columbia Gorge oh, there. Fabulous, beautiful town. Where so that, what are you saying to Tom? I'm, right I'm, I'm telling Tom, wear that hat with pride and dignity. Okay. Well, I, th I don't think you're being out of line. What if I told you I saw that Tom had it on eBay already? Um, I, it would hurt me immensely, and I would have to. I know where he lives. <laughs> Yeah, good Yeah, time. so, good um, you know, you better watch yeah. your And it would only right. take you, what, five to six days to get to his house? Yeah, and, and 10 or 12 to get home. <laughs> <laughs> Go to a 501 Chorus Echo, Tom Bukovac, and check out his show. You won't be sorry. Yeah. I'm Doug. And I'm Pat. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>